have everyone with us and welcome those who are listening by Facebook, uh, around the world, just listening to our broadcast today. I want to just say Happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there and to those who are not fathers that are fathers spiritually. You may be a spiritual dad to someone. I know I am. And uh, <clears throat> I, think, I thank God for all of you and I thank God for those who have uh, been a part of our lives. Amen. And for the fathers that are true fathers, not those that are just there by title, but those that are there by example of leading their children to live a godly life, to live a right life, and to live right with God. Amen? Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, to this morning, I want you to open up to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. And I'm going to be sharing my message today. Why the cross of Father's love? Why the cross of Father's love? Why did God choose the cross. He's a loving father. He's a caring father. He's a father that um, takes care of us and protects us. And Jesus Christ was his son. But, but why the cross? Why couldn't God do it another way? Why couldn't God just, you know, if I could say it this way, just snap his fingers and, and it would be done? Why, why didn't God just... Make it happen because he's all powerful, he's all knowing. Why couldn't he just make it happen without the cross? Well, there was a purpose, and the purpose was that he wanted us to be free, to be able to serve him, to be free from guilt and shame, to be free, to be able to worship him and to walk in his ways. And in Colossians chapter 2, I'm going to be talking there for a moment, that this is Father's Day. Amen. Fathers are ones who sacrifice a lot. And our Heavenly Father has sacrificed a lot by sending His Son on a mission, if I could say it this way, on a mission impossible to anyone else, but a mission impossible. Nonetheless, a mission that he already knew that his son was destined to be crucified, to be cruelly treated, to be spit upon, to be ridiculed and mocked. He knew all of those things, and yet he still sent his son being a father. We sang, he's a good, good father. He's a good father because he gave his only son so that you and I could live. In Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 14, just to give a little clarity, uh, verse 13, I'm sorry. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all, say all, trespasses. God has forgiven you of all trespasses if you trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you are born again, if you have received of his spirit and of his sacrifice, then you truly are a child of God. Verse 14, blotting it out, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. All of the enemy's accusations and all of the enemy's strongholds and all of the enemy's um, grips that he has on people has been dealt with at the cross. That's why so many churches today are speaking about everything else. They're speaking about healing and deliverance and faith and 
and uh, prophecy and everything else, and those are all good in and of themselves. But very little is spoken about the cross of Jesus Christ. And I believe it's because it's a diabolical plan of the enemy to not let you know where your power lies. Can I have an amen? Verse 15 says this. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, let me just say this. The word spoiled means to wholly put off from one's self. It denotes a separation from what is put off wholly to strip off of one's self for one's own advantage. He did this so that you would have an advantage over the power of the flesh and of the enemy. Can someone give me an amen? The word powers comes from the Greek word which means power of choice, Liberty as doing as one pleases. The ability or the strength with which one is endued, which he either possesses or he exercises. So God has already given it. He's already provided it, but you must use it and exercise it. Just because God has done it doesn't mean you sit there and just say, okay, God, you've done it, so do it. No. God has given you the ability, he's given you the, the exousia, he's given you the, the way and the power to choose and to exercise this accomplishment in your life. The fourth meaning of the word power, and I like this one, says, the power of rule of government, the power of him whose will and commands must be submitted to by others and obeyed. Hallelujah. That Jesus Christ did this for you and he did it for me. The Father's love of why the cross is so that we would have the power to overcome the enemy in every, in, in every situation of our lives. Hallelujah. Don't become a cemetery on me today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It also means one who possesses authority. One who possesses, not one who gets it, one who possesses it. One who has already authority. Now, I know that there are some people that don't like confrontation. And so, because they don't like confrontation, they don't open their mouth. And I'll tell you, if you don't like confrontation and you don't like to confront your enemy, he'll walk all over you. He'll come up to you and he'll suggest things into your mind and into your spirit and he will tell you all kinds of things and, and lie to you and deceive you and bring you to a place where you start to believe his lies and you start to act out what his will is. And you don't even know it sometimes. Understand this. Everything that God has done and everything that God tries to do, the devil tries to bring a counterfeit. Just as we have a heavenly father, Satan himself is a father. Did you know that? The Bible talks about those who are children of, the, of God and those that are children of the devil. First John, I think it is. So we know that Jesus said to the Pharisees, who were God's chosen people. God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And he told the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. For, your, for, the father, for the, he is the father of lies, and he's lied from the very beginning. When did he lie from the beginning? He lied to Eve in the garden. He's the father of all lies. So people that lie or people that have a tendency to not tell the truth are listening to the father of lies and giving in and fulfilling the will of the father of lies, which is the devil. God only works in truth. He only works in truth. He doesn't work in a lie. 
He only works in truth. We have authority over the powers of darkness in our life. It also means a sign, listen to this, of regal authority or a crown. You're a king's kid. You belong to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You have delegated authority given to you by Jesus Christ. In the book of Luke, he said this. He says, I have given you authority. Say, I have given. That's Jesus. He said this. Remember, I have given you authority so you can tread down on snakes and scorpions indeed and all the enemy's forces and you will remain completely unharmed. I'm reading from the Jewish Complete Bible. Hallelujah. I'll say it again. Remember, I have given you authority so you can trample down snakes and scorpions, indeed all the enemy's forces, and you will remain completely unharmed. Hallelujah. But that's to those who only believe. So many walk around defeated. So many walk around depressed. So many walk around discouraged. And they allow the enemy to speak to them, and they don't take those voices into captivity to the obedience of Christ. They let those thoughts run in their minds and in their spirits, and before you know it, they're actually acting out the very things that the enemy has suggested to them. They go into a place of self-pity. They go to a place of woe is me. They go into a place, well, that's just the way I am. That's a lie. If anyone can change you, God can change you. There are some personality traits that we think are our personality, but they're not. There are some things we've adapted in life, but we forget the spiritual side of it, that the enemy has fashioned us and molded our personalities in some ways and some fashions. But we think it's us, but it's not really us. And God wants to create the real personality of who you are. Amen. That's why I don't like the saying, God loves you just the way you are. I don't like that terminology because that gives a, ten a false tendency for people to think that they don't need to change. If God loves me just the way I am, why should I change? Why should you? God loves you just the way you are. Stay the way you are. No. God loves you, but he gave you a new way. He gave you a new life, a new, a new way of adapting things in your life so that you don't become religious, but you become relationship value with God and that the power of this cross that he's talking about and of taking the ordinances and nailing it to his cross and the principalities and powers of wickedness have been nailed to that cross so that you have the victory. That I have the victory. I'm going to read it from the uh, CJB, the complete Jewish Bible. Colossians 2, starting with verse 11. Listen to this. Also, it was in union with him that you, say me, were circumcised with a circumcision not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. Think about that. Think about that. Also, it was in union with him that you were circumcised with a circumcision, not done by human hands, but accomplished by the stripping away of the old nature's control over the body. My question to you this morning is, how was that done? How was that done? All of you graduates of the Romans course that got your certificates, shame on you. 
you should know how it's done. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 to 10 says, We know that our old self was put to death on the execution stake. That's what the cross was. It wasn't some shiny gold thing that we hang around our neck. It wasn't some silver thing that we hang around our neck. It wasn't some crucifix that we hang up on the wall. It was an execution state. It would be in our modern times like our electric chair. Nothing to be adorned, nothing to be uh, lovable about. It was an execution state. That's what the Romans used to execute criminals. Murderers, thieves. It was a place of execution. But why the cross? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. But why the cross? Because something had to happen on that cross. Something human had to happen on that cross. He had to lay down his life and listen to this. We know that our old self was put to death on the execution stake with him. With him. So that the entire body of our sinful propensities might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. God Almighty had to send his son in love, but with pain and suffering. So because you go through some pain, because you go through some suffering, it does not mean that God does not love you. For if he allowed suffering and pain with the only begotten son, how are you any different? We're going to suffer. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to go through things. But ultimately, we are more than conquerors through Christ, which strengthens us. We will stand firm in the power and the authority that God has given unto us. To live a Christian life and not make excuses. Well, uh, I'm only weak. So, no, no. Yeah, you are weak. But I am weak, but he is strong. He broke the power of the propensity of sin in you and I on that cross. That's why Jesus had to come and fulfill that. It was a human sacrifice. It was his blood that he had to shed for that we could have this new life. For the Bible says in Leviticus that life is in the blood. And for him to give that life so that your old nature could be crucified with him so that you can enjoy the freedom and have the right standing with God and you could go before God and before his throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy in time of need. God gave you that through Jesus. You can't get it any way else. You cannot get it by going to church. You cannot get it any other way. Uh, religious way, you can only get it through Jesus because he paid it for you. Hallelujah. I'll give you an example. Priscilla is like my daughter. I would never had, and I thank God John shares her with me here today. He's her natural dad. I'm her spiritual dad. Yesterday we went out for lunch. And I snuck over there, and she wasn't paying attention, and I paid the bill. She was upset. She said, I wanted to pay that bill. But the father already paid the bill. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The father paid the bill. 
just like your heavenly father paid the bill. Enjoy the benefit of the bill being paid. Hallelujah. Enjoy the benefit. Hallelujah. And it happens that way. You need to enjoy the benefit of what the Father has done for you. You need to enjoy, but how can you enjoy it if you don't apply it? Why the cross? A Father's love is the answer. A Father's love, think about this, that no earthly father or maybe maybe a certain percentage of fathers would give their life for their child in a situation. But this one, I know, very few fathers would give their life for a child that has spit upon them, ridiculed them, mocked them, said, I want nothing to do with you. Get out of my life. Don't you ever bother with me again. Imagine a child telling their father that. Get out of my life. I don't want nothing to do with you. You think that father would very easily, after years and years and years and years of that treatment, die for that person? No. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Even in our rebellion, even while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. Why? Why would a heavenly father who is love, why would he put his son, knowing, understand this, knowing exactly what his son was going to go through those 33 years on earth? He knew every moment. He knew every cry. He knew every heartache. He knew every sorrow. Every disappointment. You can understand the heart of Jesus now when he said to the disciples, you know, and those people that were with him, he said, if any man will not eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, he has nothing, no part of me. People begin to think, this man wants us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? But they didn't understand that Jesus said the words. He said these words. He says, the words that I speak, they are not flesh. They are spirit. So he's talking in a metaphorical expression. Because we don't have Jesus in the flesh to eat his flesh. That would be cannibalism. It was a metaphorical expression. He, was said, he said, I don't speak the words of, of, of man. I speak the words of the spirit. But it says, this is the point. It says that all those disciples that followed him turned around and followed him no more. They said, this is a hard saying. And then Jesus said to his disciples, will you go also? Will you go also? Listen to this. And it was in union in him that you were circumcised with a circumcision not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. Let's go to Romans 6 for a moment. I'm going to read it to you. You don't have to look it up, but you know where it is. Romans 6, 6. We know that our old self was put to death on the execution stake with him so that the entire body of our sinful propensities might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. That's why the love of God extended so greatly to you and I. In this circumcision, going back to Colossians now, in, in the complete Jewish Bible, in this circumcision done by the Messiah, you were buried along with him by being immersed and in union with him. This is not talking about water baptism. You were also raised up along with him by God's faithfulness that worked when he raised Yahshua from the dead. You were dead because of your sins. That is because of your foreskin, which is your old nature. But God, say, but God, made you alive along with the Messiah by forgiving you all your sins. 
He wiped away the bill of charges against us because of the execution state. Stripping, look at this, stripping the rulers and authorities of their power. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by means of the state. As the Father sent me, Jesus, uh, Jesus said, even so send I you. We need to realize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That you don't wrestle just against your flesh. But there are spiritual entities that want to control you, speak to you, cause you to lean upon their direction and instruction for your life and for you to follow in their way. He wants to discourage you. He wants to put you down. He wants you to remember your past so that you won't have a future. Because those that live in the past cannot have a future unless they start dealing with the present. And to start dealing with the present means to start dealing and stop looking backwards. It's time to forgive. It's time to move on. It's time to let go. Whatever needs to be done about your past, let it go. If you are born again, if you are a Christian, you have been crucified with Christ, your old nature has been crucified with him, then let it stay dead. Don't keep resurrecting it. Don't keep carrying around that dead person with you any longer and letting him speak into your life, that old man. That's not your husband, really. The old man. That's the old man that you are inside of you. Don't let it live. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, it says this. While he's getting that up there for you, I'll take a look. <clears throat> Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. That through death, listen to me, through death, what happened on that death of the cross? Huh? No, no, what, what happened? You were crucified with him. Hear me now. Understand this truth. Your old man was laid to rest through that crucifixion. That propensity to want to sin and disobey God and to walk after the flesh. All of that was crucified with Christ. Now, you can allow it to live in you if you want to. It's your choice. But he said that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus has power over death. That's why we don't have to fear death. Revelation 12, 11 says this. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because the word of their testimony. Hallelujah. Who is him? The devil. Who is the devil but the accuser of the brethren? He stands before God day and night accusing you and I before the Father. That's why he comes to you and I and he whispers in our ear, you're not worthy. You're no good. What kind of a Christian are you? 
he starts to speak all these lies. And when you believe that lie, you begin to fall into a place called the, it's the depression. You start to wonder and question. That's why the Bible says, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded. Hallelujah. You need to be persuaded about the things of God of who you are in God, that God has given you a divine royal mandate to take up the scepter of authority in royalty and take authority over the enemy in your life. Take over the authority of the enemy in your home. Take authority over the enemy in your workplace. You have the authority over the authority of all the enemy. And nothing by any means will hurt you. Jesus said, I have given this power to you, my church. That's why he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So my question to you is then why is it prevailing over the churches in America? Why are the churches in America more concerned with flashing lights, worshiptainment, what I call worshiptainment, where people worship their worship, the worship team is more elevated than God. If you, don't have, if you don't have a professional voice, you can't be on a worship team. Thank God we don't do that here. If you're not a certain way of dressing, you can't do this, you can't do that. Why is the church in America losing ground. 24,000 churches since 2013 have closed their doors and there's not enough churches that have opened. There are churches right now where, where attendance is going down, going down, going down, going down, going down, going down, going down. Why? Because I believe the church of Jesus Christ has lost their vision of the cross. See, when you take out the cross, you take out the Holy Spirit who implements that. When you take out the cross, you have to come up with another scheme to keep people. You have to come up with programs. You have to come up with this. You have to come up with that. A new this, a new that, a new this, a new something else new. Everything has to be new and fresh for the person. When the church of Jesus Christ today, 89% of the people that attend church, attend church for what the church can do for them. 11% are the ones that go to church that they can do something for God, whether it be missions, evangelism, going out and doing something for Jesus in ministry. 11%. 89% go to church for what the church can do for them. Supply their programs, their basketball, baseball teams, football teams, uh, uh, bake-offs and all these other things. And we wonder why the powerless church in America will not stand. Why people are half-hearted, lukewarm, not passionate, lost conviction. They've turned Christianity into a religion rather than a relationship. They only seek God when they're in trouble. They have rote prayers that they automatically pray from, from long ago. They can't speak to God out of the newness of their heart and just speak to him like I'm speaking to you. They don't read the word of God for God's instruction, but they'll read everything else. Some will be on the internet for hours reading, but they can't read the word of God. 
Someone can be on the phone for hours talking, but they won't talk for hours to God. You can talk about everything else you like to talk about. What about Jesus? Don't just talk about Jesus. Do something for him. Is church just something you do? Or is church something you are? Are you the church? Or are you just come to church? Be the church. The reason why I believe churches in America are so ungodly and so worldly, and the Bible says, and I don't know, some of you may agree, some of you may not agree with that statement, but I'm telling you right now, the Bible says judgment will begin in the house of God. If, God, if God's going to judge his house first, then there must be something wrong with it. And if he's going to judge the church, it's not a denomination, it's a people. Because we are the church. So he's going to judge the church first. I just wonder sometimes if Jesus was in some of these churches, if he would still tip over the tables and the chairs and take the whip and stop beating people. Oh, that doesn't sound like the love of Jesus that I know. Read your Bible. He said, you have turned my father's house into a house of den of thieves. When my, my father's house shall be called a house of entertainment. No. A house where you are blessed. A house where you get everything you need. No. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Hallelujah. And until your house is a house of prayer, your life will go nowhere. What house, Pastor? You mean on, on the street I live? No. This house. This is where God dwells. This is where his spirit lives. And until this house becomes a house of prayer. Talk is cheap. Don't make, don't make vows you can't keep. Peter did that. Lord, I'll die with you. <laughs> I'm ready to die with you, Lord, Peter said. What did Jesus tell him? Oh, great, Peter. I'm glad you got my back. No. He said, before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me three times. Cock crows twice, you shall deny me three times. Come on. See, when we put trust in our human humanity, rather than putting trust in God, we think we're doing God a favor by coming to church on Sunday. You're not doing God a favor. Why the cross? Why the cross? I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to do this because I know the camera's busy. Why the, I like being with the people. Why the cross? You think that Jesus had it easy because he was the son of God? The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he enjoyed, right? Jesus learned obedience by the things which prosperity brought to him. No? Jesus learned obedience by how his father provided everything he needed. No. How did Jesus learn obedience? By the things he suffered. That was the son of God. He was perfect without sin. And you wonder why you're going through some of the things you're going through is because God has allowed it because he wants you to be obedient and learn obedience. But if we do this, and we just shut up and sit back and expect God to do everything, you're going to be waiting a long time. Sometimes it's time for us to move on instead of staying and wallowing and wondering why the manor is not falling again. God provides fresh manna every day. 
But I bet you there's not one of you that doesn't prepare a meal to go with you wherever you go or at home. But have you prepared your meal for today? Oh, yeah, I go and I hear pastor preach. Oh, no, 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 no. No. I'm presenting the meal. It's up to you to take it home, dissect it, look at it, and chew it and apply it. That's your responsibility. Not just come to church, sit down. Oh, pastor, that was a great message. Praise God. Hallelujah. And nothing's done with it. That's not why you come to church. That's religion. That's being religious. I want to encourage you this morning. God has done so much for you. He's given you the power. He's given you the authority over the enemy. Don't let the enemy walk all over you. Take the authority. Don't be a retreater. Be a pursuer. Don't retreat from the enemy. Be a pursuer. You know, ladies, how guys, they're pursuers when they, want, when they want to have a relationship with you. They pursue you, don't they? They call you. They want to take you out to dinner. They buy you chocolates and flowers. You know, I don't know about the guys you know, but I, I suppose some of them do that, right? Well, you, you know what they call that? They woo you, right? They'll take you out to dinner, to a movie. They, they want to be with you. You know, Milan knows. She's got a big smile on her face. She knows. That's called romancing you, right? They want to do that, right? Why don't you do that with Jesus? Why don't you spend time with Jesus? Why don't you do something for him rather than being selfish in yourself? God didn't mean for you to be an individual by yourself, all by yourself, secluded. He made you a part of a body. Think of a moment if your foot said, I'm not going to be a part of your body anymore. I'm just going to go close myself into my shoe and I'm not going to be bothered. I'll put myself in the closet. How would you walk? Off your hand said, I don't want to be a part of the body anymore. I'm just going to go be an individual by myself. I'm going to do my thing by myself. Why? Because a lot of people have been hurt by people. Some people don't like people. I have a friend of mine. He's in ministry. He's in ministry. He hates people. I told him, I said, you're going to get out of the ministry. I said, you can't be in ministry and hate people. That's like a mechanic hating to work on cars. It doesn't work on them. You can't. You must apply. You must take these things that God has given you and stop letting the enemy rationalize through rational logic thinking. Because it doesn't make any sense logically or rationally for a God who is a God of love to allow his son to suffer the way that Jesus suffered. It goes beyond logic. It goes beyond reason to factual that he did it for love for you and I. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute in our brains. But God did that for you. And he did that for me. Some of you may be going through some physical difficulties. But I'm trusting God for your healing. Some of you are going through some oppression. I'm trusting God for the relief of that oppression. Some of you are going through some confusion. But I'm trusting God to clear up that confusion. Some of you need prayer. Some of you are going through some fear. I'm praying that God will deliver you from the spirit of fear. Do you know how you can be delivered from fear? Anybody know? How to be delivered from fear. You 
Yes, thank you very much. From the way out in the back there. Perfect love casts out all fear. As you know, Sister Priscilla is going to Iraq. I've heard, so, I've heard other people say, how can she go there? That's a dangerous place. How can she go there? Perfect love has no fear. The one who leads and guides her will be the same one who provides for her. And we're going to trust God for her. And you go, well, she must be like an apostle or something, you know. No. That's little Priscilla. Shy little Priscilla, when you put her on the spot. But wanting to do God's will. If I can say one thing, I'm a very selfish daddy. I'd love for her to be here with us. I'd love for her to be here in the ministry with me. I'd love for her to travel on mission trips with me. But she's going to be led by God. And, you know, it's tough when a father has to let go and say, okay. But in the meantime, I'm still praying selfish prayers. Lord, bring her back. Lord, bring her back. You know, you know, I'm still doing that. If it's your will, God, bring her back. Keep her with us, Lord. Keep her safe, Lord. And I've already told her that if she gets in trouble in these countries, that I'm forming a team and coming and getting her. So what I'd like to do this morning before we dismiss is to emphasize to you your position in Christ. Now, don't get all proudful. Walk around like you're something, because you're not. I'm not. But I want to pray for you this morning to begin to take authority. Some of you may need a, a healing in your body. I know I need a healing in my ear because I'm, I'm losing some, some hearing in my ear. I was at the gun range with the uh, New Bedford Police Department yesterday, and I was firing. Uh, I got to fire an, uh, an assault rifle for the first time. Didn't, didn't do too bad. But I had earplugs in, but it wasn't in all the way in. I kind of shattered something in my ear, so it's really bothering me. But I'm trusting God for a healing. But if you need prayer this morning, because I don't want to be too long, because I know plans with fathers, and we have plans today. I want you to come up for prayer. Something you've been struggling with, something you've been battling with, you can't seem to get the battle this morning. I believe that God is here this morning to give you the victory. If you mean business with God, if you mean business with God, I want you to come up. Let me lay hands on you and pray for you. And when we're done, I want to lay hands on Priscilla and send her off to, the, to, our, to our, her training and then to Iraq and believe that God's going to use her in a tremendous way. Whoever thought that God would take her around the world for his glory, for his purpose. And I say to John, you must be very proud of your daughter to be in the most highest calling a, a human being could ever be called by God to fulfill his will for her life. That must be a very scary moment, but a very proud moment that you have, that your daughter has been chosen by God to fulfill his will and purpose and plan. I'm going to ask, brother, if you play a little music, and I want to ask those who would come this morning. You may be struggling you want some prayer. Brother, you play a little music. Come on. And I want to ask those who would come this morning. You may be struggling. You want some prayer. Come on. And I want to ask those who would come this morning. I'm going to ask Pastor Tom, would you please come? Put that on repeat or something.
my one prayer is that you will know that how much Jesus loved you. God loved you so much that he sent his son. What an honor, what a privilege to be able to be a part of what he's done. And what he's done for you is given you the freedom. He's given you freedom to be free to be the person that he created you to be. You've been created to be formed back into his image because you lost that image. I lost that image when the fall of Adam and Eve fell. God is restoring that image of the one true God in your life, in your heart. So I'm just going to lay hands on you real quick. I'm going to anoint you with oil. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brother, Lord, whatever he's here for, whatever, you know why he's standing here. I don't need to know. You know. Father, you grant him the power and the authority over the enemy. And anything that's delaying this prayer, we take authority over in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Father, I pray and anoint my brother with oil the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray you put that hunger back in his heart, Lord. Even stronger, Lord. Stronger than what it is, Father, but stronger, Lord. Lord, he'll do your will, your purpose, and your plan for his life. Break every stronghold, Father. Every lie of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. Lord, you the devil is a deceiver. And I pray for my brother that you will strengthen him. Jesus said, I'm praying for you that your faith fails not. Don't let your faith fail you in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray and anoint my brother with oil in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you will have your way and your will in his life. Lord, I pray, God, that through disappointment, Father, you will strengthen him. That, Lord, when he goes through the valleys, that he will not look to the enemies that are surrounding him in the hills. But, Lord, he'll do what your word says in Psalm 121. I will look to the hills from which cometh forth my help. My help cometh in the name of the Lord. I pray that you strengthen him and encourage him today. Hallelujah, Lord. Have him take the authority. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, God, as he seeks you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I anoint my sister, Lord. Hallelujah. I pray, Father, that you give her what she needs today. Total healing, Father. In the name of Jesus. I thank you for her healing the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, I anoint my sister, Lord. Thank you for bringing that wonderful baby into life, Lord, and healthy, Lord. I pray, Lord, for my sister's health. I pray, Father, that she would take authority over the enemy that would lie to her and deceive her. I pray, God, that you would give her the strength spiritually stand up and fight. Fill her with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Father, I just pray for my brother, Lord. I pray, God, that you anoint him. But Lord, you have, you have a special work for him. And the enemy fights that. And I pray, Father, that you will open doors that only you can open. Close doors only you can close for his life. Let him trust in you believe the lies of the enemy, that you're going to forsake him, that you forsake him. You have not forsaken him. Father, I thank you. You will do what you said you would do. In Jesus' name.
spirit subject to her by your name. Over her family. Over her immediate family. Over her circumstances and situation. Father, you've made her a warrior in prayer. A warrior in the spirit. In the name of Jesus. Whatever her need is right now, Father, I pray that you meet that need. Take away any confusion, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for my sister right now, Father. I pray, God, for divine protection. I pray for divine protection over her. As she walks out her walk with you, divine protection. I pray, Lord, that she would not have fear. Lord, she would walk in your ways. Read your word. Attend church, Father. Hear your word and apply it, God. Become a strong woman of God that you can use for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Lord. do great things. Don't look to the left or to the right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know this is going to sound funny. But God's showing me that you can stick them on your hands. Stickum is used in football when they throw a football so they can catch the ball and it sticks to their hands. God says, I want you to clean your hands because you've got to stick them. You give me a problem, but you take it right back. It just keeps coming back on you because you keep trying to reach up and take it back. The Father says, clean, clean those hands. Clean those hands in Jesus' name. Trust him. Let it, let it go. He knows better to know what to do than you do. Hallelujah. He knows the Alpha and the Omega. And the Omega. He's the beginning and the end of all things. And he knows what's in the middle. You don't know what's in the middle. Hallelujah. You only know the beginning, but you don't know the end. Hallelujah. Father, I pray, God, all this pressure. Put your hand on your heart. Man. All these palpitations that are going on, Father, I command them to come into obedience to Christ right now. I pray a spirit of calmness and peace. Father, like water off a duck's back, let the problems that she goes through and, and, and annoyances that she goes through just run right off her again. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Lord, take away fear. Fear of her children, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 That demonic prophecy that he told you about killing your children is not going to happen. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, that's broken in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for my sister, Lord, my daughter, my other daughter too, Lord. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But Father, give us strength to obey you at all costs, Lord. At all costs, we're obeying you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Lord, meet whatever need she has. Hallelujah. 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 Fill her cup. Fill her cup. Hallelujah. The Lord just showing me that you always seem to have that cup half full. And you're saying, Lord, why? I want more, Lord. Why do you feel like I'm half full? God said, I'm going to fill you right up. I'm going to fill you up to overflowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to have such joy in walking in favor with God. Hallelujah. But don't compromise. Don't compromise. That's the word I got for you. Don't compromise. Be strong. Don't compromise. The 
moment you compromise is the moment the cup starts to empty out. God says, do this and I'll do that. Be strong. Be strong. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father God, that he would return to his first love. Deliver him from those things that easily besets him. Let him not go backwards, but forwards. Father, if he's gone on a slippery road, I pray, Father, that you clear it up, Father. Let him walk steadfast, unmovable, unshakable. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Brother Nelson, would you please come? Annie and Tom come as we pray for Priscilla's trip. Father, thank you for this servant. Thank you for the love she has toward her mom and dad. An overpowering over love for her mom and dad. Thank you that her dad is standing beside her today. And as we anoint her father, she has another father, you, her heavenly father. She's blessed today because she's got three. But Lord, you're most important. And she loves you more than anyone else. And that's the way it should be. We pray, Father, for her divine protection. That all fear would be removed from her. That, Lord, you are blessing her going in, her coming out, her lying down, her rising up. We pray a wall of protection around her. We bind the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. And we bind every plot and every scheme of the enemy that would try to do something in Iraq. And we bind your powers right now in Jesus' name. She's going to go and she's going to return to this land again. And Father, you're going to protect her with a wall around her, a shield around her, Father. Like Job had a, had a hedge around him. Lord, I pray that hedge around Priscilla as she goes. And use her for your glory, Lord. Use her in those children's lives, not just for English, but that they may come to know you, the one true God, and serve you and love you and get saved, filled with your Holy Spirit. Now, Father, I pray for her father, Lord John. I pray that you give him comfort and strength and trust to believe not only in you, but in his daughter and her hearing your voice. Lord, he has seen her go through the most difficult times in her life she was in that hospital but Lord you brought her through so that you may be glorified through her life I thank you and I praise you Lord and so Father this will always be her home I don't care what church she belongs to or wherever she goes this is her home and Father we send her with your anointing and your blessing in Jesus name all God's people said, Amen. If any of you have anything you want to speak to her, go.